Glad to see you this evening. Well, a little change in the weather since this morning. What do you say? Uh, just wait a few minutes in Newfoundland. It changes. <laughs> well, it's good to see you here uh, again tonight. I was listening to some music as practices were happening, getting ready for Christmas. So uh, make sure you're inviting folks to come out to that special evening and looking forward to that. So it's good to see you here tonight, looking forward to the, what the Lord has for us. I enjoyed singing with you this morning and got some comments on the songs. Hopefully you enjoy the ones tonight. We'll start with an old favorite, Higher Ground, number 421. 421. I'm pressing on the upward way. New heights I'm gaining every day. Stand with me if you can, 421. I'm pressing on the upward way. I want to. I want to. What do you want to? What do you want? You know, I find generally, if we want it bad enough, it's what we do. And so I, I just appreciate those thoughts. I want to live above the world. And uh, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for today. Thank you for good service this morning for each one that was out for visitors and Lord, we thank you that we can gather together in this evening hour, and we pray your blessing upon this service. Pray your blessing on our missionaries. We thank you for them, and we ask that you would meet their very special needs that they have in different places around the world, that you'd provide for them, give them strength, protect them, give them courage in the places they serve you. We ask your blessing on this service now. We pray that you use it for your honor and glory, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Be seated, please. Number 689, Jesus Loves Even Me. Number 689. <clears throat> Yeah. 
three or four notes ahead of everybody else. Yes, he loved to do that. He'd be three or four notes ahead of everybody else. I think that was one of uh, Pastor uh, Murray Davis's favorite hymns. Number 611 is next. Number 611. Out of the Ivory Palace. I looked at my notes. I don't think we've sung this one for a while, if at all this year. So we're going to fix that right now. 611. 611. music but that song looks like it's hard for me to pl hard to play it's got all those sharps and flats and naturals and all stuck in there <laughs> I'm sure that means something <laughs> sharps and flats but they change them in the middle of the song 
mean, it starts with three flats, and then, and then in some place it says, no, it's a sharp. And in some place, no, it's a natural. And I, I have trouble, four notes, every, every, every note you sing, there's four notes you have to hit on the piano. And well, two with each hand usually. But uh, it just, I'm thankful for those that play instruments here. I, I really am because it, it uh, you don't know how blessed you, I've been in churches traveling. They had no one to play the piano. And I come in and they say, oh, by the way, you're leading the singing a cappella. And I, I, normally I start way too low. And I normally have my wife with me, so she helps me. It takes about three notes in to get to where I'm supposed to be. And then, then we move along pretty good. But uh, I'm, I'm thankful for those. And thankful for the number of people we have here that can, that can play and are willing to, to serve and minister in that way. Let me mention a couple of things. Uh, next Sunday evening, Pastor Godfrey's going to be with us. I appreciate him taking the time. He's here, has been here for uh, almost a week. A little more than a week, and uh, he's uh, going to be in Marystown in the morning and be here at night. And looking forward to seeing him and his dear wife again. And uh, they have just have been a blessing to our church, but also certainly to the church there in Carbonier. As Pastor and Mrs. Minion have gone there to pastor that ministry, and I know that they'll be excited about seeing the ministry there. More excited to probably see their grandchildren than the ministry, but uh, they, uh, I'm glad they can be here for a little bit. Uh, December 2nd is the Academy program, Friday evening. It's the Academy program. You'll want to be here. It's, it's just going to be a blessing to you. And uh, we will not have a, that will be our midweek service that week. We won't have a Wednesday service. That Friday will be our midweek service. And then, of course, December 16th, a Sunday evening, is our Christmas musical. And we're looking forward to that. Uh, Pastor Thiessen, uh, pardon? Is that a Friday? Is the 16th a Friday? 16th is a Friday, not a Sunday. Okay. Pastor Thiessen, Thiessen says thank you and uh, for the time you can spend here. And uh, these last two weeks have been a little different. Uh, we uh, at the Parsonage had water problems. We have copper, had copper piping in there, and three times it had leaked. And so uh, I talked to uh, Lowell, and uh, he mentioned the deacons, and we... This week, a crew was in and replaced all the copper piping with, uh, with PEX, and uh, uh, that was about $3,000 to get that done. And then uh, we have to, besides that, because water got out, ruined carpet in two of the bedrooms, and so the rest of the carpet there uh, was about, I don't know, 30 years old probably. And so we're replacing the carpet there. That'll cost, again, and I'm not sure just how much, someplace between a dollar and $4 a foot. And uh, then, of course, we have to finish. There's about a lot of the uh, uh, ceiling has to be fixed and stuff. So it's going to be someplace probably between six and $8,000 to do that. And we don't need a vote to do that. We're taking out of our maintenance budget. But I just wanted to let you know that we'll be spending that money um, in these next few weeks to uh, do that. And also, Gord is online getting someone to do the eaves trough along this side of the building. We put... Uh, uh, pipes for downspouts going down into the weeping tile. That would be about $1,500, I think, to do that. And uh, we spent a lot of time fixing the lawn and the sod and things there, and we need to keep the water away from the building uh, there. And so I think that's money well invested. If you have any questions about either one of those, you can ask me later on. I'll, I'll let you know a little more about what's going on. But I uh, just want to let you know that. Let's return thanks for the offering. Lord, we thank you for the way you bless and meet our needs. Thank you for loving us. And, Lord, we pray that you might bless this offering as we give our tithes and our gifts, that you'd use it for your honor and glory now in Jesus' name. Amen.
and write musical on me. <laughs> All right, let's give this a go. We'll start with 360. Put your finger in 650. What's the connection? 360 and 650. I see some heads nodding. 360 and 650. What's the connection? No, there's another head just clued in. Another one. No. Same. Same author to the words, yes. All right, so let's sing a couple of stanzas in 360, and then we'll get our key change, and we'll do a couple of stanzas in 650. All right, let's stand if you can. First two verses of 360, and then a couple of verses in 650. We'll see how the Spirit moves. You follow me. I'm not sure which ones we'll sing. <laughs> but we will start with verse 1 here in 360. All right, so we're all together. Oh, 
thank you so much. Please be seated. I love to tell the story. You know, there's a difference between the facts and the story. Some of you are old, old enough to remember Dragnet. Remember that? Was it Jack Webb? Was he the one? Just the facts, man. Just the facts. Well, if all we know is the facts, and the facts are important, then we're losing a lot. The story. There's a, another hymn that we have a story to tell to the nations. There's a, there's a difference. The story fills in the details. Stories have emotion. Stories have feeling. And uh, I'm just impressed with this lady that wrote these, the words of these two hymns. She wrote a lot longer poem uh, than those two, but uh, uh, they wrote the words to those that, that she says, you know, I heard the story. Because I heard the story, and it's not said there, but because I believed it, now I love to tell the story. You know, it's great when God's people love to tell the story. And, you know, basically just the story of what God has done for them. Maybe just what God has done for us recently. Maybe not even going back to salvation, which is important to tell. But what God's done. What God's done in your life. How God provided. How God met a need. How God protected. How God directed. You know, people in this day and time, they want to know there's hope. We live in a world that is messed up. People are confused. People don't know which direction is up and which direction is down. They're looking for some stability. You know, we can be that to some people. We have a story to tell. John chapter 7 in our Bibles. So we continue on through there. Lord willing, we'll finish this uh, chapter. Start with verse 40, and I'll read down through verse 52 as we begin through the end of the chapter. This uh, begins, Jesus is still, has gone up for the feast days, and he's gone to the temple and he's taught, and uh, he gets a lot of different responses from different people. But in verse 40, it says, Many of the people, therefore... When they heard this saying, said, of truth, this is the prophet. Others said, this is the Christ. But some said, shall Christ come out of Galilee? Hath not the scripture said that Christ cometh of the seed of David, and out of the town of Bethlehem, where David was? So there was a division among the people because of him. And some of them would have taken him, but no man laid hands on him. Then came the officers of the chief priests and the Pharisees and said unto them, Why have ye not brought him? The officers answered, Never a man spake like this man. Then answered the Pharisees, Are ye also deceived? Have any of the rulers of other our Pharisees believed on him? But this people who knoweth not the law are curse. Nicodemus saith unto them, He that came to Jesus by night, being one of them, doth our law judge any man before it hear him? And know that what and know what he doeth? They answered and said unto him, Art thou also of Galilee? Search and look, for out of Galilee ariseth no prophet, and every man went unto his own house. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for your word. And Lord, as we look back in time to these events in the temple there we look at people with different opinions about Christ Lord I pray that our heart be settled on who Jesus is tonight he indeed is the Messiah the son of David the creator of the world it helps us understand that people are confused about who Christ is Help us, Lord, to have a clear and distinct opinion ourselves as we look at Scripture. And help us, Lord, to be able to tell them clearly and simply that Jesus is the Son of God, the Savior of the world, the Messiah. Bless now as we look at your word in Jesus' name. Amen. 
we see there's division among the people from verses 40 down through verse 44. The people are around him. They hear him preach, and everybody has an opinion. And they start to express their opinions. I don't know if it's while he was preaching, if they're talking to one another, or after he got done with one thought before he went on to another thought. I don't know. But there's a division of people had a difference of opinion about who Jesus was. And so we see that the first comment said of truth, of a truth. This is the prophet. If you notice your Bible, prophet is capitalized. It's not just someone who, a prophet is someone who foretells or foretells the gospel. But it's not a prophet, but the prophet. Going back to the Old Testament, there's, it's, not exactly clear where this comes from, but probably it comes from Deuteronomy chapter 18 and verse 15. And there it says, And the Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet, again the prophet there is capitalized, from the midst of thee, of thy brother, like unto me, unto him shall ye, ye shall hearken. According to all that thou desirest of the Lord thy God in Horeb in the day of the assembly, saying, let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, neither let me see this great fire any more that I die not. And the Lord said unto me, verse 18, They have well spoken that which they have spoken. Verse 18, I will raise up, I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren, like unto thee, and put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. The prophet Jesus, I believe that Moses here is receiving instruction about the prophet who would come, not a prophet. It's an individual who is, has the title, the prophet. And the children of Israel this time, in, we're looking back, in, back to, they knew the book of Deuteronomy. They knew the law well. They knew the Old Testament. They'd gone through synagogue. They'd been taught up until 10 or 12 years of age, very clearly memorized great portions of the scripture. So they knew what the Bible said. But the question was, who did they attribute this title, the prophet, to? At this time, those who knew the scripture were looking forward to anticipation of the Messiah, because this is the time the Messiah would come. In Daniel chapter 10, the 77s of Daniel, we don't have time to look at all that tonight, but it told very clearly about the time, from the time of the, the order to rebuild the temple in the time of Nehemiah, until the Messiah, the Prince. And it talks about the 70 weeks there. And so it was clear to anyone who read the Bible, who understood the Bible in those days, that this was the time of the Messiah. They believed that the Messiah was someplace in Israel. They were looking, the devout were looking for the Messiah. I think the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes were afraid of the coming of the Messiah. But the devout, we find a large group, not only that, a different group called the Essenines there, were godly people looking for the coming of the Messiah. And so they said, this is the prophet. But we find that there was a disagreement. Kind of a disagreement of semantics, really. Others said, this is the Christ. They said, this is the Messiah, the promised Messiah of the Old Testament. They knew well the promise of the coming of Messiah. The Jewish people still look forward to the coming of the Messiah today. They did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah who would come. But they said, in the end of verse 41, notice the, the phrasing here. Others, some said, this is the prophet. Others said, well, this is the Messiah. And then someone spoke up in contradiction. And they said, shall Christ come out of Galilee? They said, wait a minute. If he is the Messiah, they knew who Jesus was. They knew he had his home there in Galilee, in Nazareth, at Capernaum. They said, if he truly is the Messiah, he's coming from the wrong place. 
He must not be a true Messiah because he's from Galilee. Hath not the scripture said that Christ, verse 42, cometh of the seed of David and out of the town of Bethlehem where David was? They had a little knowledge. Sometimes a little knowledge is dangerous. There's some people I've met that know, the, know a lot of scripture verses. They know and they can repeat scripture verses to you. But they do not believe the God of the scriptures. Well, they know, they know a lot. But what you know in your head is sometimes different than what you know in your heart. They said, you know, we know that Jesus of Galilee is from Galilee. There's no question about that. It's where he lives, where he's raised. But they knew he would come of the seed of David. In 2 Samuel 7, verse 12, it says, When thy days shall be fulfilled, thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, and I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels. I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish his throne of his kingdom forever. Verse 7, 2 Samuel seven sixteen, And thy house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. Paul writes later on in Romans chapter 1, verse 3, concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. So they knew he would come from the seed of David. It was no, it was no doubt about from the Old Testament. If you look at the covenants in the Old Testament, we see beginning with the, uh, the what we call the Protevangelium, the first gospel in Genesis 3.15, where the Messiah is promised to Eve, and then we find the Messiah promised to Abraham, and then the Messiah, the promise of the Messiah comes through Isaac and Jacob, and then to the house of Judah, and then to David. They knew all this. They said, you know, he's from the seed of David, but also it says, also they say that he has come from Bethlehem. Now, that is short memory. Thirty some years before that, there was a big stir in the city. A lot of these men were old enough to remember that. These weren't, they may have been only in their teens, their 20s, but they were raised in houses of Pharisees and scribes and Sadducees and priests. And some 32, 33 years before that, wise men came from the east to Jerusalem. And they came to the palace of the king of King Herod, said, where is he that is born king of the Jews? The whole city was in an uproar over that. And they brought some of these scribes in. And they said, well, that's easy. Bethlehem. Bethlehem. Herod, of course, tells them, go and see and then come back and report to me. And they didn't come back and report and he slaughtered the innocents in Bethlehem. Micah 5, 2, But thou Bethlehem Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me. Let us be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. They knew this scripture as well as you and I do. Better probably. They knew the Messiah would come from Bethlehem. But what they could not comprehend, or things they did not know, was that Christ was of the seed of David. We have the genealogies, of course, in Matthew and Luke of Christ. Going back through both of them, going back through the seed of David, one through the line of Mary, one through the line of Joseph. Back to David. He was of the seed of David. We also understand that Christ was born in Bethlehem. Just because he lived now in Capernaum or Nazareth, there at the north of the Sea of Galilee, 
does not mean that that's where he was born. They had a little knowledge. You know, a little knowledge can be dangerous. I find commercials interesting. I found a big change in commercials for women's cosmetics. Yes, I watched those. They're advertising now that you use hyaluronic acid. How many have seen a commercial that says their product contains hyaluronic acid? You know, hyaluronic acid is different than hydrochloric acid. Just so you know that. They're not interchangeable. But you know, if I had just a little information and I went and said, listen, that, that stuff is forty nine ninety five for a little bottle like that. I can go, I can get a whole gallon of hydrochloric acid for nineteen ninety five. Think of the money I would save. A little, a little knowledge can be dangerous. And here we see that there was a little knowledge. Yes, they knew that Jesus was in the seed of David. Yes, they knew that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem. But they didn't stop to examine. They didn't stop to consider what, they, what already they knew that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. The Messiah was there. They didn't stop to listen to John the Baptist when he came preaching, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world, Jesus. They didn't stop to consider before when Jesus was there in the temple and Jesus healed the man there by the pool of Bethesda, that this was the Messiah because it interrupted their life. It interrupted their plan, interrupted what they thought they wanted to do. You know, as Christians, God often interrupts what we want. God interrupts sometimes what we think we know. And God says, you know what? We should listen to the Bible. I don't know how many times I've, I have thought that something was in the Bible, or the Bible, and then I found out I was wrong. We find in verse 44, and when some of them would have taken him, but no man laid hands on him. Who was the some of them? It was the officers. In verse, verse 45, look back at verse 32 of this chapter. We looked at this a couple weeks ago. And the Pharisees heard that the people murmured such things concerning him. And the Pharisees and the chief priests sent officers to take him. This is an escalation from last time Jesus was there. Last time Jesus was there for a, for a holy day, they, they, sent him, they tried it, but he left. Now he's staying there in the temple. The chief priests here, the Pharisees, they heard that what the people were saying. Now why do you suppose it bothered them that the people were murmuring, saying these things about Jesus? Because if Jesus truly was the Messiah, then it would bring their structure down. What they had built up over the years, they had built themselves up as the paragons of religious spirituality. They had built themselves up as the only ones who had access to God. And now Jesus comes, and they're threatened by it. And their only recourse that they can think of is to use carnal means to arrest him. Why, why was their only recourse carnal means? Because they weren't spiritual men. They weren't godly men. I was reading recently again through Second Chronicles. And we look at our world today and we see a lot of things have gone wrong. And there are a lot of things, and we as Christians, we have, to, we have to walk a fine line. We have to be vocal about the truth. But we have to not use carnal means to try to accomplish the truth. 
I just have, don't have much use for going out and protesting in the streets, for, for causing a big ruckus about things. I think we ought to stand for truth. I think folks should know we stand for the truth. I think we should uh, proclaim the truth when it's available to us. But going out and have, you know, if we decided we're not going to do this, if we decided as a church we're going to have a big rally and a big protest over some social issue, I got everybody in the church to get placards and march on Confederation Building and go round and round, we would get the news media there. And the news media would decide that we're a bunch of nuts. Even if everything we said was true, we classified as a bunch of nuts. But in Chronicles, what does it say? If my people, which I call by my name, will humble themselves and pray. See, it's a spiritual battle, not a carnal battle. The Pharisees, they, they didn't understand this. And so they decided that they need to intervene. So they sent the temple guards. These were Jewish men. These weren't the Romans who were stationed there. There was a Roman garrison right at the temple. But uh, they didn't get the Romans involved. These were, these were temple guards. These were Jewish men who were given responsibility of, of guarding the temple. And they came and they said here back in our text where we're at, they said, why haven't you brought him? You see, these guards were under orders. And they're soldiers. Soldiers are used to obeying orders. And so it was just contrary to what the Pharisees might speak because they were the ones that gave orders to these men that they would order these men, go and arrest this one. The soldiers went, and think of, think of the picture with me now. Jesus is there, probably in one of the porches around the court of the Gentiles, and he's preaching and teaching. He sees these soldiers come up. I don't think they would have sent a large band, maybe for six, eight soldiers. They're dressed as soldiers. They're, they, they're, you can easily identify them as soldiers. The people in the crowd, they look around and say, what are they doing here? Why are the soldiers here? Who's, who's done something wrong? But Jesus knew exactly why the soldiers were there. He knew they were there to arrest him. Didn't change his message. Didn't change his topic. He continued on. But notice their conclusion. Never man spake like this man. The officers had been in the temple. They'd heard a lot of things. They'd heard the, the scribes and the Pharisees. They'd heard the, the Sadducees. They'd heard them all speak and preach, if you will. They'd never heard anything like this. Matthew seven twenty nine says, For he taught them as one having authority, and not as the scribes. Mark says much the same thing in Mark chapter 1, verse 22. Why can we speak authority with authority? A number of years ago, I was traveling in Edmonton with a college group, and uh, we uh, had a van, and the van, I had let the girls off where they were staying. I was taking the guys someplace, and we were driving on the road, and there was a bunch of nicely dressed young ladies along the road. And we were having a meeting at this, it wasn't at a church, it was at a hall that night. And uh, they said, uh, pull over, we're going to invite them to come out to church tonight. And I'm sure they had entirely spiritual motives. So, pulled over, and the guy sitting next to me rolled down his window, and, and uh, the uh, one girl walked up, nice looking girls. She had this little badge, sister so-and-so. the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So they invited them all, and, you know, I thought that was the end of it. Well, that night, I got up and started preaching, and somehow, I know this doesn't usually happen, I got distracted. And 
the topic came up and I said, mention these young ladies. And I said, it's a shame these young ladies are here. Nice, seem to be nice young ladies, but they're here in the streets of Edmonton spreading their damnable heresies. I parked there for just a little bit. I got done. I got back and shaking hands. Guess who was there? We shook hands. I expected them to be angry. And she said, one of the girls said, oh, they never preach like that in our church. Tried to talk to them about the Lord and about the gospel, but, you know, they answer all the right questions, but they don't know the Lord. But see, we, we can speak with authority. We know Jesus Christ is our Savior. We have the Word of God. Jesus spoke with authority, not like the scribes. The Pharisees had some objections. Look at verse 47. Then answered them the Pharisees. Answered to what? To the soldiers. Are you also deceived? Of course, the implication is that everyone who's listening to Jesus is deceived. He is a trickster. He is a fraud. Have any of the rulers of the Pharisees believed on him? No, they ask that question. They don't like the answer. They get a little bit later on. But this people knoweth, who knoweth not the law are cursed. So this is an inferior group of people that are listening to Christ. Those that are following him, they don't know the law. They don't know the law as well as we do. If they had the spiritual advantages that we do, if they had studied under the great teachers that we have, if they'd gone to the right seminaries and schools that we have gone to, they would understand what a fraud this one is. They say, you're fooled by this preacher from Galilee. They say, you shouldn't believe anything that we don't believe. They set themselves up as the authority. It's easy to write off those who disagree with you. And that's what they did. They said, this one, he disagrees with the theology of the temple these days. Because of that, he is wrong and we are right. You know, the majority in Israel at that time believed the scribes and the Pharisees. But the majority was wrong. The majority of the population of Canada today, if we laid out the gospel in its very basic, simple terms, they would tell us, you are wrong. You are being deceived. You're following after a fraud and a charlatan. But we understand, we know we are right and they are wrong. Eternity will determine that. You know, it's easier to label people than to listen to people. We, today we, we get, we sometimes think that we accomplish more by talking than listening. When someone's talking and trying to tell us something, I don't know how many people have done this to me, they get out halfway through a thought and we say, yeah, yeah, yeah. In other words, don't continue on. What you have to say has no value to me. Or what you have to say, I already know, so there's no reason you keep on talking. But it's amazing what we learn if we just listen. I know some of this, that's just a habit we got into. Just listen. Let us somebody finish their thought. Ask them questions instead of spouting off all we know. Because people, people look for somebody that care. And if we won't listen to them, they don't believe we care, and we probably don't if we're not willing to listen. 
in the middle of this, in verse 50, Nicodemus speaks up. Now, I don't know if Nicodemus had spoke up before. Nicodemus saith unto them, he that came to Jesus by night, of course, John chapter 3, being one of them, one of the, one of the Pharisees. Doth our law judge any man before it hear him, and know what he doeth? He speaks up. They're all in one voice criticizing, condemning Jesus. Saying he can't be who he claims to be. He's not of the seed of David. He's not from Bethlehem. He's from Galilee. Nicodemus speaks up. He says, doth our law. They were great on rules and regulations, laws. He said, we say we have a law. We should live by it. Our law requires that we listen to someone before we condemn them. Doth our law judge any man before it hear him? Our law requires that we judge actions by actions, not accusations. What has he done that's so bad? Think of the boldness of, of Nicodemus. Stepping out in the midst of the whole group. If the Sanhedrin was there, 70. If not, there was a large group of Pharisees, scribes, Sadducees. Speaking out in the midst of them. When they with one voice had condemned Jesus Christ as a fraud. Nicodemus was saved. He says... Maybe we ought to stop and practice what we preach. He says, shouldn't we judge him according to our law instead of our prejudice? Verse 52 and 53. Then they answered and said unto him, Art thou also of Galilee? Search and look, for out of Galilee ariseth no prophet. The rudeness. He said, what, are you from Galilee? In John chapter 1, we looked at this earlier on, when uh, Jesus was speaking, was calling his disciples. John chapter 1, verse 46, And Nathanael said unto him, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip said unto him, Come and see. Nazareth, of course, was in Galilee. It's when Jesus was of Nazareth. Can there any good thing come? The region of Galilee was the backwaters. They were the country hicks, if you will. They were the uneducated one. They were the fishermen and the farmers. They were not, there, was not, there, were not, there was not a center of theology. These scribes wrote off a whole section of their country. Out of Galilee ariseth no prophet. Again, they're saying this out of their ignorance, their pride as well, that there's no way. They didn't stop to think that somebody might have been born one place and moved someplace else. Gamaliel the prophet in Acts chapter 5 verse 37 speaking of Christ says after this man uh, uh, speaking of some false prophets after this man also rose up Judas of Galilee in the days of the taxing and drew away much people after him he also perished in all and as even as many as obeyed him were dispersed Galilee apparently early on had a history of having some false prophets come from it Gamaliel speaks of them but Gamaliel comes to the conclusion that we ought to be careful. Because if this is really a false religion, it'll come to nothing. But if not, look at, John, look at uh, Acts chapter 5. 
Acts chapter 5. And verse 37. Verse 38. He says, and Scumaliel speaking, And now I say unto you, Refrain from these men, and let them alone. For this counsel or this work be of men, it will come to naught. But if it be of God, ye cannot overthrow it, lest happily ye be found even to fight against God. And to him they agreed. They called the apostles and beaten them. They commanded they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Even though Gamaliel was a teacher of the law, a member of this religious organization in Jerusalem, he had some spiritual sense. The Pharisees. Verse 53 to me is a little bit humorous. And every man went unto his own house. Who are the men they're talking about? It doesn't say in particular. It could be the people that Jesus was speaking to in the temple. He was done. And they went home. I got an idea, though, it's speaking of the scribes and the Pharisees there. And they've gone through this big ordeal. They heard Jesus was preaching and teaching in the temple, sent the guards to arrest him. The temple guards disobeyed him, came back empty-handed, said, never a man spake like this man. They were, they were roundly condemning Christ, and Nicodemus spoke up, and the only thing they could do was criticize him and say, are you from Galilee too? You know what? I think they didn't know what else to do. They didn't know what else to do. So they went home. I think they were frustrated. Didn't know what to do. So they went home. The whole thought of this last part of this chapter is who is Jesus? That was the big question. Oh, they went through a lot of things. But who is Jesus? Let me ask you a question tonight. Who is Jesus to you? We think a lot of agitates for Jesus. The song says, Jesus, what a friend of sinners. Jesus, the Messiah. Jesus, the Savior. Jesus, the lover of my soul. Jesus, the creator. Who is Jesus? We could spend the next couple of hours going through the names and attributes of Jesus. But my preaching them or teaching them from this pulpit is not what's important. What's important is, what is Jesus to you? Is he, as David said in Psalm 23, is he my shepherd? Is he my guide? Is he my protector and my provider? Who is Jesus to you? Lord, we thank you for your word. Thank you that we can gather in this evening hour and thank you for this account, although it's troubling that these religious men were so blinded that they refused even to consider that Jesus was the Messiah. But Lord, I thank you that some did. Thank you for the boldness of Nicodemus. Thank you for the honesty of these soldiers. Thank you for those that listened to him as he taught there probably for several hours in the temple. Help us, Lord, to have a proper perspective of who Jesus is. Help us to make a difference in our life. We we'll give the praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Pastor mentioned several times in this message tonight, never man spake as this man. My thoughts went to the wonderful words of life. Number 181 in your songbook, please. Number 181. Stand with me if you can as we close. Sing them over again to me. The wonderful words of life. Wonderful words of love. 